previously on Third and Roll. Yeah, it's a new innovation that we're trying out here in the CFL this year. It's a quarterback coach communication device. Hamilton returns the ball all the way down the field. That looks as though it is a 95-yard touchdown. I think we just been decimated here because it's 1980 by cocaine. <laughs> Well, I have just been informed that the Labor Day Classic, in fact, takes place in Hamilton, and I have driven the wrong way around Lake Ontario. Well, that's a pretty good strategy, because you know me, I have weak knees. It is an age of Canadian football domination. In the West, the Edmonton Eskimos are a dynasty without equal. Behind the quarterback tandem of Tom Wilkinson and Warren Moon, the Eskimos won five consecutive Great Cup championships between 1978 and 1982. In the East, four teams battle it out through a six-game season to see who will meet Edmonton in the championship game. The Toronto Argonauts have not hoisted a Great Cup since 1952. Will this be their year? Let's find out. This is Third and Roll. Welcome to Third and Roll, a Canadian football board game podcast. This is the podcast where we play the 1985 board game Canadian Armchair Football. My name is Spencer. This is my brother, Alec. Hello. Today is episode seven. We are continuing the Labor Day Classic. Our good friend Dwayne is here, and he is playing as the Hamilton Tiger Cats. In today's episode, we are going to continue and complete the first half. And then at halftime, we have a special surprise as we learn a little bit more about why Bruce Clark chose to sign with the Toronto Argonauts instead of the Green Bay Packers of the National Football League. So with that, let's throw it up to our guys in the booth. We've got Edward Welch, Norman Knuckleberger, and Dave Marler. Edward, take it away. Hamilton really penned into their own side of the field here. Let's see where they can go from here. We are... With that, we are approaching the... This is the three-minute warning. So from this point on, the clock will be stopping after every play. Okay, guys, we got the ball back. Now, there's some confusion over there about the 55, 50-whatever-yard line. Okay, I'm from Mississippi. I don't know anything about that. I just know how to throw the football because I have weak knees, which is what I'm going to do. Throw a long pass. We only got a couple minutes left. Got to make it happen. Okay, so here we go. So we've got Marler under center. He is looking for Ross Clarkson deep and looks as though the Argos have busted through the sidelines. Looks as though they have trapped the quarterback. Let's see uh, what... Actually, no, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's see what's the... What's... Can Jackson get out of it? He is in a real bind here and he finds Clarkson. It is a pickup of 20 yards. So Marler, using some of his fancy footwork, is able to bring the ball up to the 28-yard line. Wow. He looks as though he was going down there. Uh, Bruce Clark was just licking his chops, getting ready to knock him down. Looks as though he was trying to knock him down onto the right side of his body. He seems as though maybe he was listening to the pregame show, but he was not able to do it, and Marler got the ball down the field, and it is a first and 10 Hamilton from their own 28s. All right, great job by me, B-Boys. Um, let's uh, run the same play again. Just kidding, we're running a screen pass. They'll never suspect that. Marler with the ball to screen pass over to Crawford. Crawford is trapped behind the line of scrimmage for a loss of five. But let's see if he can pick, let's see if he can get out of it. Crawford breaks the tackle, makes it out up the right-hand sideline. And so with that, it is a net of 20 yards on the pass. So he was going to be stopped five yards short, was able to slip through the tackle. And that is back-to-back 20-yard passes for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. They are up at their own 41-yard line. This is looking to be... A good drive for the Tiger Cats. Well, two plays in a row where the Argos really looked like they'd been able to get the stop there. They're all, they, they were trapped, but then Hamilton found a way to break through. Maybe they're really finding something here. They're trusting in their man from Mississippi State, Mr. Marler. 
Uh, maybe it's this potentially not legal technology that they're using to communicate between the quarterback and the coach. That being said, they had that same technology in the first quarter and it wasn't working for them. So let's see if they can keep it going. First down, Hamilton. It is first and 10 from the 41 yard line. Okay, I was throwing the ball really hard just then. I'm super tired. Let's do a run from option. It's going to be Crawford. Crawford doing a run out of the option. And there is Bruce Clark. Bruce Clark, who was drafted in the first round for the Green Bay Packers, refused to play. Signed with the Toronto Argonauts instead. Stops him for no game. So it's going to be second and ten Argos. Ah, jeez, you guys. You got to just put it together. Okay, fine. I'll do everything myself. Let's uh, run a screen pass now. Barlard's taking this team onto his back, trying to drag them all the way down the field. Looks as though he's looking to do a screen pass out to Clarkson, and that ball was dropped. It was right there in his hands. Clarkson was not able to bring it in. So with that, it's going to be a third and 10 Tiger Cats from their own 41-yard line. There is still 45 seconds remaining in the second quarter. This is James Franklin, quarterback for the Toronto Argonauts, and you're listening to Third and Roll, the Canadian Football Board Game Podcast. Clarkson is really not endearing himself to his new home here in Hamilton. He's had two touches in the ball. One, a very good catch, but then immediately fumbled. This one was a very makeable catch right there in his hands, and he was not able to hold on to it. Coach says there's not, a lot, not enough time left, so we're just going to go for it. We're just going to throw a long pass. Hope for the best. Marler is back. He is going straight back. Clarkson deep down the left-hand sidelines. It is 25 yards downfield and looks as though it is Preston Young of the Argos who came up with the ball. Preston Young, that is our first interception of the game. Let's see if the Argos can do anything with it on the return. So Young with the ball and young is able to pick up an additional five yards what play long pass it was a it was a four it was a five no it's four right well oh, that, that was that was his was, role but it was also no you moved that are you saying it wasn't a four are we going to do a do-over guys I, wait long pass incomplete r5 yeah, yeah i don't think it was a four i think it was a five no it was a three and a one but guys that's fine i'm okay with that I, I, I can make mistakes, so I'm not sure that that's what happened, but let's do that. And so instead... Oh, oh yeah. it's another Third conference time. of the officials, uh, the, the officials huddling again. They seem to be trying to uh, change their rulings. Uh, looks like this is one uh, that the commissioners are going to be taking a look at later, trying to sort that out. I think that ball hit the ground. I tell you, I saw the ball hit the ground. That was not, <laughs> that was not a, that was not a turnover. That was incomplete. Okay, so we, the, the officials are conferring, and yes, it looks as though Preston Young was not able to hold on to the ball. The ball did touch the ground. There's a flag on the play. Let's take a look at what that flag was, and that flag was defensive holding. Goodness. <laughs> Preston Young, you had the opportunity, you had the interception in your hands. Not only did you not hold on to the ball, there was some clear tugging there. That's a 10-yard penalty. It, of course, was third and 10 for Hamilton. So that's going to bring the ball up to the 51-yard line. And Dave Marler has got a second chance at life here. Wow. Wow. Wow, you know, the holding penalty is painful at the best of times, but to see in a situation like this, uh, really giving Hamilton a new lease on life here in the dying seconds of the first half. So there are 35 seconds remaining in the first half. Still plenty of time. They could run easily probably about four or five more plays. Within that time, they are at the 51 yard line here. Okay, we're running a sweep. So Hamilton not gonna rush things here. They are running a sweep. They're going back to Crawford and Crawford gets stuffed by Clark. That's a loss of two. So it is- Time out. Looks as though Hamilton has called a timeout. That's an interesting choice because the clock does stop automatically after every single play within the three minute warning. 
they're charged they're choosing to use one of their timeouts that I did not believe they had but they are you know we're gonna grant them that we were gonna stop the clock anyway so the the officials they're looking they're nodding and they're saying just give it to them just give it to them they're waving their hands and possibly a patronizing manner they you know they're hearing it from the crowd I think these officials, they're, I think they're trying to gin the game so that it's more competitive. They're being nice to Hamilton here, and uh, they could have brought in another flag for doing an action that is not outside of the rules of the game, but they're going to let them have it. So with that... No, I don't like what's going on here. I mean, it looks like... Are, are they doing some kind of uh, some kind of promotional thing, like taking a break, some kind of advertising thing? I mean, this is... This is really not what this game's all about. Yes, Canadian armchair football cannot be bought. What can I say? I'm just a Mississippi boy. A Mississippi boy about to throw a long pass. The Marler with the ball. He's got 29 seconds left. The ball is up. He's looking for Clarkson again. And this time it was swatted down by Preston Young. So that is an incomplete pass. It is going to be third and 12. Hamilton... There are 15 seconds remaining in the first half. Okay, I'm going to have to run a pitch at this play. Hope for a touchdown. Okay, so Hamilton deciding not to punt here late in the first half. And it's a pitch out. Can he make the 12 yards? He makes half of it. So Rufus Crawford gets stopped. It is a pickup of six. There are five seconds left in the half. Looks as though that play took a little bit of time to develop. Argos will have the ball. Is that right? Is that at midfield? And, you know, Norman, yeah, you can see, of course, uh, I'm smiling here because I love when the ball is. It's, it's midfield. We don't have to call it. It's always numbers. It's always, oh, what number is the ball at? But now we're at the left. Now we're at center field. This is a place. It's not just a number. We're in the exact center of the field. I don't know. I just love the symmetry of it, maybe. So it looks as though there will be time for just one last play of the game, of the half here. What are the Argos going to do with it? Yeah, you can see, like, some teams would just take, would take the knee here and kill out the clock. But, uh, you know, when you have time, you use it. Absolutely. So the Argos, of course, have, uh, you know, got to be future Hall of Famer Terry Greer has not been very involved in this game or this season to, to you know, for, for that matter, because they've been really relying on Metcalf. Jackson is looking for Greer now. He's trying to find the back corner of the end zone. The throw is up and it is, it was overthrown. Overthrown. That's going to be an incomplete pass to end the first half of the game here in Labor Day. It's 14 to 7 Argos. Let's throw it down to the sidelines. Coach, you came in here. Hamilton got off to a hot start. They had that kick return touchdown to start off the game. Were you intentionally trying to settle down the crowd with choosing run after run after run after run after run on that first drive there? What was your thinking? You know, when I first got all this feedback about, you know, this they, what they thought of this uh, play-calling uh, style of mine, you know, I was a little disappointed because, you know, I'm ha I want to please the fans. I want to give the fans a good game. I want the excitement. But, hey, I'm here to win a football game, and I have a football. I want the football to get to the end zone, so I'm going to keep holding that football unless anybody can stop it. If they can't stop, if they can't stop it, then why am I going to throw the pass? You know, the fans want excitement, but if I give them excitement and I lose the game, then I'll still get fired anyway, and we don't win. So, you know, it makes me really defensive, though, because I want to please the fans. It, it's hard. It's hard to be the bad guy. But you know what? This is, this is Hamilton. This is where you got to soak it up. you got to soak up that hate, that feeling of, you know, they don't like you because they don't like Toronto. It doesn't matter. You could do anything. They're not going to like you. So I'm, you know what? I'm gonna let that fuel me. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna make these fans unhappy. That's what we're here to do. Well, when you, I suppose when you're a visiting coach, that's exactly what you're gonna do. Walking into the locker room here with a seven-point lead. Let's go back to the studio and let's see what the boys' thoughts are on the first half. <laughs> 
Greetings from the desk of Dr. Footius Polunicus. In ancient times, men played with balls, and little more detail than this is known. But there are some accounts in the ancient literature of games which evoke what we now call football. For one called in the Greek, Phininda, and in the Latin, Harpastum, is described by the Greek rhetorician Athenaeus Nocratius as this is my favorite game. Great are the exertion, he says, and the fatigue attendant upon contests of ball playing and violent twisting and turning of the neck. And then he quotes the comic poet Antiphanes Damn it, what a pain in the neck I've got. He seized the ball and passed it to a teammate while dodging another and laughing. He pushed it out of the way of another. Another fellow player he raised to his feet. All the while the crowd resounded with shouts of out of bounds, too far, right beside him, over his head, on the ground, up in the air, too short, and pass it back. <laughs> okay, so welcome back to the studio. I am, I am Ed Welch. I am, of course, here with Norman, Dave, and Brett. Again, it's very unusual to have a, a playing quarterback in here at halftime, but that's how you really get to be inside the mind of the various players. Let's take a look and uh, let's, let's kick it to Brett. Brett, what were your thoughts on the first half? I cannot believe what they did, what the officiating crews are doing to this game. They are taking way too long to find out where they are on the field. They don't know if it's first down, if it's second down. They don't know which direction on the field they are going. How hard can it be? What kind of... How much more help do they need to get a sense of where this is going and what are they doing to this game that we call football? I cannot stand it. I am livid. I think it is absolutely ridiculous. But I gotta say, I'm a little peeved too because I picked Hamilton to win and they're down. They got off to a hot start. I'm hoping that they're gonna come with an equally hot start to start the second half. Of course, Hamilton will receive the ball to start the second half. But I am furious. Uh, Dave, I, do you feel like you're trying to push the ball too much down the field? Do you have to be more patient? Oh, yeah. We're, we're screwing up. We're just trying to uh, give the fans here what they want on Labor Day in 1980. Hamilton has been decimated by crack cocaine and AIDS. Um, our team was partying way too late last night on cocaine, which is a ritzier form of crack cocaine, as you may know. Um, of course. I think we're just going to try and do, uh, you know, roll the dice and uh, throw some big plays uh, in the next half. Dave, you are really endearing yourself to the local fan base here. By uh, you really, you really call it as you see it. You know, you're not, you're not going to sh- sugarcoat things for uh, this the, the, this Hamilton team. They're going to love you or they're going to hate you. I, I tell you, I love Hamilton. This place is my adopted, not only city, but country of Canada, me coming from Mississippi. But I tell you, it is just crack, crack, crack everywhere here in the 80s. It Well, let's, uh, you know, rock, rock and roll, as they say. You did say roll in the dice. That is significant. I don't know why, because we're playing football, which is a game that does not involve dice. Uh, it's a metaphor. <laughs> it's a metaphor. We're thank taking you. a lot of chances. We're rolling the dice thank on these you. plays. Yes, thank you. Gambling, of course, but for professional sports. Norman, what do you think? You you picked, you and I both picked Toronto to lead. Uh, they're they're doing pretty well so far. What do you think about the way that uh, Willie Wood is calling the game and and Metcalf is running down to that defense? What do you think? Well, you well you know Edward, I'm just thinking about the Toronto defense because you know Hamilton came out there with uh, the big star, big play on special teams, but then they were they've been shut down, and you know if. I'm really, I think 
it's something about the curl zone on number number two. When number two goes flat, uh, the Argos are continuing to the curl. Mm -hmm. And uh, then to get their eight-man front, the weak corner moves into about three yards off. Uh, it stays about three yards off the nearest defender. The safe, safety moves out of position, of course, uh, slightly outside the widest receiver uh, on the weak side. Uh, but then go to the middle one-third zone, and the disguise is complete, and uh, clearly that uh, was a very, uh, you know, simple uh, point that uh, I have just made. Um, but you, certainly... Norman, you could not have made it any simpler. You could not have made it any simpler if it was just being read out of a book. It was just as simple as it could be. I feel as though I'm seeing the X's and the O's in my mind, there are, there are lines, there are directions. I don't know. When you have a weak side shade defense with three deep coverage, then, like, then the strong side goes on, on, on uh, deep coverage. So, I mean, uh, when you switch the nickel package, you only got a two-man two deep for the robber coverage. So they really need to implement stack alignment uh, so that their linebackers can share responsibilities with the D-line. And uh, then if they use a slide version of the stack defense, this will be effective versus the running game. Norman, you don't need to explain to us the game of football. We know how the game works. We saw it right there. We're here. I mean, I'm, I'm of course, sitting here in the studio, and when you guys aren't here, they turn the lights off, but I'm able to listen to you, and so I can at least know what's going on in the game. You don't need to tell me how to play football. I played football for 12 years. I got hit in the head twice every year for my last six years, and I said, I'm done. Now, no hold, more. hold on here, Brett. Now, I'm a real uh, football junkie now, and um, I've been playing this game ever since I was a little boy, presumably back in Mississippi. <laughs> and uh, I just love hearing this, uh, Minutia. I love hearing how the Canadian brand of football is played much different than the uh, football that I was playing back in the States. So this stuff to me is endlessly fascinating. And you know what, Dave? I am on your side as well. Uh, Brett, I mean, maybe he gets a little bit lonely here in the studio by himself. I'm just loving it. Norman, you are, you know, they don't call you the professor for for nothing. You're just really laying down the knowledge on us. Let's take a look at our first half stats. So first off, Something that really jumps out to me. So offensive plays. Toronto has had 16, while Hamilton has had 8. So Toronto really controlling the, the play of the game throughout the first half. Hamilton evenly splitting its play calling. Four runs, four passes. So four rushes for 19 yards versus four passes for 70 yards on Hamilton's side of the ball. Whereas Toronto is, is that right? It is 81% of their plays have been running plays. 13 runs for 88 yards versus three passes for 72 yards and a touchdown. So the lone passing touchdown goes to uh, Mark Jackson and the Argos. Of course, the Argos have not had any turnovers where Hamilton had that one fumble. So, but really, Toronto trying to control the play of the game 160 yards total offensive yards in the first half, whereas Hamilton has 89. So with that, let's go back out to the sidelines. We've got a quick interview with Hamilton's head coach. We have not heard much from him so far in this game. Let's see what you think. Coach, what did you say to your uh, team there back in the... But back in the locker room, did you give him a pep talk? Did you tell him just to stick to the game? What did you What did you tell them? I just sat in quiet disappointment at these guys. I really, there's nothing I can say to them. It is Labor Day here in Hamilton. It's a, a, a huge day for the labor community in this place. It's that and May Day, which are our two days for the workers of Steeltown. And if you can't get up for Labor Day, I, I just don't know why you would be out here. Absolutely. I mean, I cannot, I cannot agree with you anymore. So thank you very much. So ha Hamilton's head coach, Barney Frank, uh, it's so happy to have you there. Let's go back up into the booth. Thank you very much, Mark. So we are ready to go here. Uh, yeah, yeah, Norman's just been waiting for his chance to like step out for halftime 
and uh, <laughs> you know the. That's uh, that's fine. That's fine. Let's. Uh, okay. Looks as though. That looks like that sounds like lightning. Oh my goodness. We are going to have a delay of game. The second half is on hold. There is lightning overhead here at Iverwind Stadium. Norman looks as though you're going to get a chance to run outside and sneak that smoke. Uh, just be sure to stay at least nine meters away from the entrance. Who am I kidding? It's 1980. You can smoke right here. You don't have to go anywhere. We'll be right back after this. This is Chad Owens, the flying Hawaiian and former receiver for the Toronto Argonauts. You're listening to Third and Roll. Canadian football board game podcast. So Dwayne, so this What's is up? this is your first this is your yeah. first this is your first time playing this game. Um, yeah. This is Alex's third time playing yeah. the game. So he he's he's got he's got that advantage. Okay, specifically what I talk what I want to talk about with this uh, the board game itself. This board game being Canadian armchair football from nineteen eighty five. Yes. The um, yard markers on this board are very fine. Yeah. I mean, I get it. You have to put like 110 of them on here. You know, that makes sense as a football board. But I wonder if they could just have designed it a little bit so it could be a little more clear. Mm -hmm. Would it shock you to, to learn that this game is no longer being produced? Yeah, I, I, I get that. <laughs> yeah, how do you like my uh, running crack cocaine and AIDS jokes? That's, We're going to get a lot more in the second half, by the way. <laughs> that's, uh, I mean... It is 1980. Wasn't that later? In, I mean, yeah, a bit early on age. Well, main character is a little more advanced. You're prescient. You're prescient. I feel yeah. that there's <laughs> there's there's going to be uh, some there's a syndrome that is going to be acquired. I, I, I yeah. it's going to be acquired soon. Yeah, a lot of people think uh, that. Wait, who invented uh, crack cocaine AIDS? Was that? The Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah, was that under Bush? Or I guess Bush was the head of the CIA at the time, right? So, yeah. I mean, fine. So that was under Reagan, but by Bush. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a historical fact. It's true. Okay, great. Maybe it started as like a pilot project in Canada, so that's why we got it first. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, they said that uh, Trudeau took a long walk in, in the in in the snow. Oh, right. It was senior Trudeau as well. Boy, it's. Uh, yeah, guys. Nineteen eighty is twenty nineteen all over again. A long walk in the snow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Come on, guys. Got that. Come on. Yeah. Guys. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh... I was taking that as sort of a reference, which I didn't know that was referring to, but I was just taking it poetically. You don't know what the reference of the long walk in the snow was? That's when he decided to. Uh, I knew that part. Resign. Oh, I did, okay. I did, oh, so, oh, okay. There, I didn't right. get there, the cocaine the part. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're listening to Third and Roll. Can I say the same thing, but in Tamil? You know, Kurt Dekondi for the Third and Roll. So just for a little context for anyone listening to this. Yes. It's the board. It's got a nice CFL helmet logo in the center. It says Canadian Armchair Football. Yeah. It has very fine yard markers all the way up and down the length of the bifold board. And on the right side, you have a series of helmets representing four of the Eastern teams. Yes. And yeah. that's the board that we're looking at. And that's the board. Uh, just before we get back into yep. the game, um, I did set up a long-winded kind of joke, but it was sort of, I wasn't really sure how the pod was going, so it was dependent on fictionalized characters. Yes. And I teased a uh, punter from Spain. Yes. I'm just going to drop that. Yes. See, the joke was going to be that I called him a football player and that in the second half I'm going to realize that football is something different over there. And I'm very disappointed with how he plays. Okay. But we're just going to drop that. That's fine. Why are we dropping that? that... Because... Well, because it's based in reality. Because Bernie Ruoff is Canadian. And yeah. he is the, uh, when I heard you mention punter. Bernie Ruoff, I was like, oh no, that goes that whole plot line. <laughs> secret 
behind why Bruce Clark signed with the Toronto Argonauts and other Green Bay Packers. It's a funny thing how this came to be. Every week, Edward and Norman and I carpooled together to the game. This time for some odd reason. Edward suggested that I get in the car with Ron. Now, now Ron is sage. He is wise. He is wizened. But that man needs a navigator. So I find myself here in Kingston, listening to the Labor Day Classic on the radio. And what is coming up next esteems me the most. We've got Edward Welch, who's supposed to be doing the play-by-play, getting to the bottom of the Bruce Clark mystery that has enveloped this entire season. Rest assured, third and rollers, I will be back next game with an extended interview with Toronto Argos linebacker Ron Southwick. But for now, I'm going to throw it back to Edward Welch to provide the interview that I was waiting all season for. Edward Welch and Dave Marler getting to the bottom of the Bruce Clark saga. From the Harveys in Kingston, this is Todd Gray saying, see you next week. All right, so we are back here in the studio. It looks as though the lightning has dissipated, but the officiating crew are waiting for us. Our, the officiating crew has to give it a certain amount of time just to make sure there's not going to be any lightning here in the second half. The fans here at Ivor Wynn are slowly filing back into their seats. They're looking a little bit wobbly. Uh, looks as though they had a f- they, they had uh, several refreshments uh, during the interlude. Uh, in in the meantime, let's let's take this opportunity um, to speak to our man on the inside, Dave Marler. Dave, uh, you although you went to uh, Mississippi State, correct? I. I we here have been wondering what is the story behind Bruce Clark. So, do you want me to say some of that, or do you want to? Say- no, I'm fine. I just thought you may have been giving more background okay. on the man, the myth, the legend, Bruce Clark. So, B- Bruce Clark was an all-star out of Penn State. He was drafted fourth overall in in the NFL draft by none other than the Green Bay Packers. He refused to sign with the Packers and instead came to Canada, to the CFL, and signed with the Argos. He has been an all-star defensive tackle this year. But we always wondered why turn down the opportunity to play in the NFL for a fairly sizable salary, one would imagine, uh, to instead... Uh, play in the Argos, and we're very happy to have him. But we—he's—he's he's been very tight-lipped about it. So we've been trying to interview him. You—I understand. Uh, we were talking during the break here that you have a little bit of insight. Well, in the off season, um, as you know, a lot of CFL players like to spend time in the discotheques in Montreal, and uh, that's where Bruce Clark and I became fast friends. And you know, it's ironic that we're here on Labor Day because it was on Labor Day many years ago that uh, Bruce Clark decided to visit Toronto on a holiday, and that's where he took a Canadian lover. Mmm! So you're saying Bruce Clark. Twins, yes, that's correct. Bruce, wow, Bruce Clark, when he was still at Penn State, took a vacation to Toronto where he met a... Toronto woman. A Toronto woman. Wow. And and had some kind of dalliance with her. Is that is that correct? Yes, he has two beautiful children, a boy and a girl, and uh, he just can't let them go. He can't he can't leave Canada because his um, girlfriend is a criminal, obviously, and she can't cross the border. But um, yeah, he's just here for the kids. Okay, so the kids are twins. Yeah. So when he initially said that he had a Canadian lover, and then immediately shot out twins. 
Maybe maybe, uh, maybe maybe it's where my mind was going. No, I thought no, no, no. He's a he's a, he's a family man. He's a he's a good Christian guy. He's a good Christian guy, and and uh, so yes, and then she is his his girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, not that Christian. Not not that Christian. Not able to enter the United States, and 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 does that? I mean, you you've been mentioning it throughout the game so far. Uh, a, a particular type of uh, I guess some people call it a party drug. Some people call it a, a a street drug. I'm talking, of course, about crack cocaine. No, it's actually boring tax stuff. Oh, yeah. So she so for tax reasons, she is not able to go from Toronto to w- Wisconsin. Yeah, it's a lot of lot of tax fraud uh, that she committed, but she served her time. And uh, you know it's uh, it's all squared up with the uh, with the taxpayers, so we're pretty good now. And this is tax fraud in Canada or tax fraud in the, in the United States? Well, it's uh, I hate to say it, both. Oh my goodness! So I guess you know I mean they they they, they really say sometimes that the the IRS has teeth and the CRA has gums. Marvin Dre, I work for Canada Customs and Revenue. Ah, the tax man. A tax man. Pardon? I'm not the tax man. I'm a tax man. Saying the tax man is just a little dehumanizing. Thank you very much. Wow, this has come up before, hasn't it? And so I suppose she is safe here in in Canada, but if she ever crosses that border over into Wisconsin, so Bruce Clark turns down hundreds of thousands, you know, money that potentially could be used to pay off both the IRS and the CRA. Because it would mean spending time away from his girlfriend and his two kids is deciding instead to turn down those large sums of money to work in Canada so that he can be close to his girlfriend who will continue to have to suffer the, the, the stress of dealing with these uh, large tax bills. As was my understanding, but my defense at discotheque was very loud, so I can't be 100% certain. It does get very loud, and and uh, Norman, you and I have been to a couple of discotecas, and uh, we've had some very extensive conversations, uh, and uh, I can't say that I remember much of the details of any of them. I remember there was a very strong bass, uh, there was very strong gesticulation, there were points being made uh, very exuberantly on both our parts, but the content, there's only the music. The music. See, that's the difference between people like ourselves and me being a broadcaster, you being a former player, versus Dave Marler and Bruce Clark being current players. Current players, they get to sit in a booth where they can actually listen and hear one another so that you can retain the information so it can be shared later on on a public broadcast. Well, I cannot wait to see the next time that Bruce Clark and yourself meet each other in a hallway because... It sounds like something like that was told in secret, but I'm really appreciative that you would share that with us today. So if we see a big sack coming up in the second half, I think he might be laying a a little bit of extra mustard onto that particular hit. But you know what? Dave, you did it for our audience. Now we have the mystery that why did Bruce Clark not sign in the NFL? It's because he has a girlfriend with two kids who has committed, it seems like, very serious tax fraud, both in Canada and in the United States, owes a lot of money and is facing potential jail time if you go, if she were to go to the United States. I just have to say, I'm, I don't, I'm not worried about getting punched because, because this isn't Labor Day. This is all going to be tape delayed. You're not going to air it because none of those guys are working. So we're probably going to watch this game, what, Wednesday, Thursday, Something like that. Right now, broadcast broadcast these live, do they? Uh, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> ooh um, let's, uh... TV n- later, Norman, right? let's uh, book it back up to the uh, yeah. booth here. I don't really want to answer that question. We're on live-ish. live-ish. All right, so, okay, so it looks as though the, uh, the officials are saying that the, the lightning has passed, the skies have cleared, the tipsy Hamilton Tiger Cats fans have fully made their way down back to their seats. So let's bring it back up. Xenon Andrew Shijin is up there at the 45-yard line. 
I, I believe the Emerald Pennant must uh, interject that in the very first play of the game was a Toronto Argonauts kickoff, resulting in a kickoff return touchdown by the Tiger Cats. Therefore, to begin the second half, we will flip the circumstances. And I believe it is time for the Tiger Cats to kick the ball. Well, you know, when you're right, when you're right, rules pedants. This is not the first time in one of these broadcasts where I felt a little bit foolish, where there's a very simple element of the game that I have not been able to retain. It's not as necessarily that I don't know it, but while I'm speaking, perhaps I do not recall the history. It is, uh, I gotta say, I, I really have to thank the network for allowing us to drink within the booth. It uh, really brings on a little bit of extra color in the second half of the game. But you're absolutely correct. It is Bernie Ruoff, the national, coming on to kick the ball off. Next time on Third and Roll. I've checked the rule book. There's nothing in the rule book against deflating the football. Can we at least have one game where we do not have 30 yards of penalties on one single play? And the Argos seem to have forgotten what down it was. Apparently I've been naming the plays very loudly so the defense can hear us. Third and Roll is an independent Canadian football board game podcast recorded in Toronto, Ontario in 2019. Today's episode features the voices of Spencer, Alex, and Subi. This works for me. Thanks, Subi. Our cover art was illustrated by Bryce Hall. This episode was edited by Spencer Adams from Toronto. Our theme music is Magic Mountain by Jazzar. Brett Brannigan's theme is The Spellbreaker by Tritachion. Both songs are used through a Creative Commons attribution license and freemusicarchive.org. Ron Booman's theme is Box Mach für Ach, performed by United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. The Pedans theme is Box Variatio in a Sank Club, performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Todd Gray's interview music is Box Aria Variata, variation number three, performed by Brandon Kinsella. That's a lot of Bach. All Bach pieces used are in the public domain. If you'd like to help support the show, you can tell a friend or leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcatcher you use. Or you can head on over to patreon.com slash third and roll and become a patron to get exclusive early access to new game episodes and to become a recurring character on the show. If you want to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter at third and roll or send an email to third and roll at gmail.com. New episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on third and roll.